Welcome back to another episode of the Two Christian Dudes podcast. We're getting quite a bit of a ways now at this point into season one. If you, and if you've been following us along for all the previous episodes, we are continuing our journey talking about near-death experiences. Our guest today had a lung transplant. He dies on the table. He goes to heaven. And we're going to let him tell you more of what he encountered uh, during his time, as, as we might say, on the other side of the veil. So let me bring Randy and Mike into the conversation here, and we will get our conversation underway. Randy, take it away, sir. Thank you, Sean. And it is such a pleasure to bring uh, Mike with us on the show uh, today. We've been waiting a long time uh, to bring him on the show so that he can share his fascinating story. You're going to hear something very exceptional from Mike today, and that is that uh, he is not only an organ transplant uh, recipient, he also um, went to heaven and met his donor in heaven. So I'll let you tell that story, Mike, and what happened. But uh, let's start with uh, your reason for having the transplant and how that came about uh, with your experience with Jesus Christ in heaven. Great sure. to have you here. Uh, glad to be here, guys. And um, yeah, what a journey it's been. So I'm going to kind of tell you a story before the story, okay? So kind of leads up to it. So I was sick for about five years uh, with a what's called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a scarring of the lungs. They don't know what causes it. It's killing as many as breast cancer. And uh, so in 2000. 14, I was diagnosed. Um, prior to that, there was a ice storm here in Kentucky, and uh, I had pneumonia, and, and think that kind of kicked it off. But anyway, so I uh, had been diagnosed with uh, this disease. Um, I went uh, and had a lung biopsy done to just make sure that's really what it was. And uh, after the biopsy, I, I was put on oxygen 24-7. So I had uh, uh, two uh, what we call E-tanks that I was dragging around behind me for quite a long time. So I got on the transplant list, but uh, for me, I had to wait a very long time on that list. So as I was waiting on that list, I wanted to tell you this story. So my wife and I uh, were doing a lot of public awareness to bring awareness to this lung disease that nobody knows about. And so I was meeting with politicians and celebrities and anything I could do to get the word out about this disease. Now, I, I, I'm a preacher. I believe in signs, wonders, and miracles. That God can do anything he wants. And uh, and yet, here I come down with this disease. And I said, well, I could be bitter about this or be uh, better at this. And so I decided to be better and be proactive in what was going on. So I used to meet with uh, lung patients. When they called, uh, I, I tried to you know, just be there for them online in the different support groups for lung disease. So anyway, uh, I got a call one time and uh, a friend named Mary said, hey, I'm, I'm in the area. I'm going to be at this uh, state park and I was wondering if you'd come meet me. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to meet face to face. I said, sure. So we go over there and we meet and we have a really good time. And, and then uh, my wife, beknownst to me, she was really struggling with the fact that I had a terminal lung disease. and. So we were driving home late at night, and uh, she started singing this song by a, a Catholic monk musician, Christian musician named John Michael Talbot. And the song was, uh, Father, I place my life in your hands. So we were driving down the road, and, and this is what she told me she was doing. She was lifting all her burdens up to heaven and said, you know, I can't handle this. I mean, financially, physically, emotionally all these things that are going on with Mike. So she started like lifting them up, like placing in them with her hands in the car and just placing them in God's hands and says, you take this, this is too much. So she started singing, Father, I place my life in your hands. And I joined her and all of a sudden, right in front of us, we're driving like, I don't know, 55 miles an hour down the highway. And uh, all of a sudden this deer appears out of nowhere. And so I, I slammed by my brakes and I, and we just both cried out, Jesus, you know, I thought, I thought I'm not going to get, get 
you know, I'm not going to die from a lung disease, <laughs> terminal lung disease. I'm going to die from this deer coming through the windshield. So all of a sudden, when we cried out, this deer was like 12 inches from the bumper. We had no other choice but to, you know, brace for impact. And all of a sudden, this deer disappears into thin air. And we're looking and we're, I, we're shaking. You know, we stopped on the highway and we're looking behind us. And we're, I'm like, where did this thing go? Where, where, did, where did it go? So uh, we, uh, you know, start driving home. And for the first day or so, we were like really baffled. Like, what was that? I mean, like, it was like a Star Trek episode. I mean, this thing appeared dematerialized and just wasn't there anymore so you know being the uh you know bible student that i was i i i started thinking of scriptures you know like what does this deer mean we call this our deer story what does this deer mean and i'm thinking of scriptures that say as the deer pants for the water so my soul pants after you god well that didn't fit and so then i called my son because he was an irish dancer and uh, we adopted him, and he, he got into Irish dancing. He loved it. So his nickname was the Leaping Deer. And uh, uh, we were at a, a service one time. This guy calls him out and says, your name is Leaping Deer. And so, so I called my son. And I said, hey, like, uh, did God show you anything lately? Or, you know, any kind of deers come in your pathway? And he's like, no, Dad, I don't see visions. So I said, okay, all right, just checking, son. So we got off the phone with him, and then all of a sudden it's like, like an epiphany, like in my mind, I thought, wait a second. I remember studying the tribes of Israel in, in Bible college. And I remember them, you know, had banners all around their camp with signals, like uh, signs, uh, images. And one of the images was a deer. So I looked it up and it was the deer symbol was the tribe of Naphtali. One could have, a, uh, uh, I think it was the story of Rachel and Leah. One could have a child, one couldn't. And the Lord said to the one who was uh, uh, hiding, uh, and he, he said to her, I have seen your struggle. And all of a sudden, I thought, oh, my goodness, that's why we saw this deer. God, had, God answered our prayer. that we, He saw that we were struggling, not in our faith, but in, in our emotions and, and knowing that I was dying. And so anyway. That's the kind of God I serve. I mean, he, to me, uh, that's natural Christianity, really, that God would send a sign like that to, to, to encourage us to say, it's okay. And that happened six months before uh, I got the call for transplant. Okay, so fast forward. So I, I was diagnosed with this terminal lung disease, um, never smoked. So I was, you know, really, wow, like, how did this happen? And so... Uh, so anyway, I was diagnosed with this uh, IPF, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and I started getting weak uh, pretty quickly, and my oxygen needs increased, and uh, I was just purely running out of time. So I, uh, you know, as I said, I was I was doing some, uh, you know, uh, awareness and meeting with people, and I, how I did that, I have no idea because I was so week but i did it anyway so then it came up to the time i i finally got a call and i was in my backyard and i i do like folk art uh so i was out in a cabin and i'm working on my folk art and i hear the lord's voice saying you put that stuff up you you need to go now you just put all that stuff up oh, wow that's kind of weird that i would hear his voice Staying to do that. So I, I, I put it all up, got back to the house, and my wife says, the hospital's on the call. They have a pair of lungs for you. I'm like, wow. That's, you know, after waiting a very long time on the transplant list, I thought, wow, this is incredible. So uh, we go to the hospital, and um, and I think everything's going to be hunky-dory. I thought, oh, man, this is this is worth the wait. And uh, God had already told me ahead of time. A lot of people were praying for me, you know, saying, we're going to believe a miracle and we're going to believe in supernatural lungs to come to you. And, you know, it, interesting enough, we had a friend that came over uh, right before the Lord spoke to me to go back into the house that uh, a couple of days prior to that, 
uh, a friend came over and we had never met her. My wife knew her from work uh, and her friend came. They said they wanted to pray for me. So I said, sure. So they came over and this lady just says out of the blue, she goes, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I just saw a vision of a pair of lungs coming down from heaven and being put into your chest. She had no clue. She didn't know I was going to get a call for transplant a couple of days later. So anyway, and sure enough, I got the call. So anyway, I went to the hospital, got prepped and, uh, you know, got wheeled into the OR and, uh, you know, for, for, you know, first, what, hour or so, you know, things were just going okay. And uh, my wife is back home uh, because we live like 15 minutes from the hospital. And uh, she was uh, home sleeping. And all of a sudden, one of my oxygen tanks on the front porch fell over. Boing! You know, these things are like really loud when they fall. So anyway, my wife's like, what? That's never happened. In all these years, we've had these oxygen tanks stored on the front porch. So anyway, um, she woke up and she called the uh, hospital and they said, first lung in. So she's like, wow, okay, God woke me up to let me know the first lung's in. So then after that, uh, I think it was like a 12-hour surgery. So uh, second lung goes in and uh, as they were closing me up, um, the doctor took the clamp off too early and I bled out. I died on the table. So what they do during those situations they were trying to get me back to life so they uh transfused me with a bunch of uh blood but during that time i see myself rising off the operating table and i'm a jokester so i just said to myself well at least i'm going up <laughs> you know because that's a good thing so uh now you know as a pastor i i kind of knew i had the assurance you know i knew the scriptures i had you know, I knew that, that I, I would be going to heaven if I ever died, but, you know, I just, I didn't find it. I don't know. I just found it kind of comforting to know I was rising up off the table. So then uh, as I got off the table, though, all of a sudden I heard all these negative voices and they were saying, you're not good enough. Who do you think you are? And just taunting me. And I thought, well, I know what that voice is. And I said, in the name of Jesus, Leave me alone and shut up because I'm a child of God and you can't say those things. And all those voices silenced and never spoke again. And as I was, anyway, this is where I get emotional. So as I was rising off the table further toward the ceiling, um, I saw these rainbow lights swirling all around me. And um, I'm like, wow, what is this? I was trying to discern, you know, like, I still had my mental faculty, so I was trying to discern, is this a medicine? Is this, you know, what is this? And then uh, these uh, bright rainbow lights uh, started singing, and then I knew it was angels. And I saw like a myriad of angels, and, and they were singing, Mike's coming home. Mike's coming home. They were so happy. And then uh, I heard a voice saying, no, he's just here for a visit. And as I rose up into this bright light, I, uh, I was just overwhelmed. I was like, I'm standing in heaven. And as far as the eye can see, it's, it's bright light. And it was just the feeling I had was like total bliss, total, like, I can't explain it. It was just like, I just felt like I was engulfed in light. And then I felt like, all of a sudden, I didn't, I was, I was thinking, I didn't feel, you know, like my life. I, I started thinking about things in my life that I had done. And it was like, the realization came right there in heaven. And I was like, it, it's all taken care of, Mike. And then I just, the, the thought came, Jesus is all in all, every molecule. I feel his presence throughout this spance. And I think, Oh my goodness, I just thought to myself, I worried about way too much stuff on the earth. I was worrying about my finances. I was worrying about my health. I was worrying about my, even as a Christian, my spiritual condition, did I do enough? You know, was I good enough? Or, you know, like, you know, I knew Jesus took care of it, but when I got there, he did take care of it. I mean, it was like the slate was washed clean. Everything was like, 
the realization was like, Mike, it's not you anyway. <laughs> why, why were you even thinking that? It's all Jesus. I mean, the, the whole place was filled with his presence. You know, the glory of the Lord fills the temple. That was, that's the Lord. And so as I stood there, though, all of a sudden I got emotional. I started thinking about the donor. And I thought, oh my, this guy died so that I could live. This guy died so I could have his lungs. And so I was like, I don't know. I, it wasn't like, I thought I'd said it out loud, but I think it was my spirit man. Because in heaven, when I was talking back and forth, it wasn't like we were speaking. It was like our spirit was speaking, I guess. So anyway, I, I, I cried out through my spirit. And I, and I said, I want to thank my donor. And then I'm, it, just all of a sudden, I looked behind. I don't know why. I just felt a presence behind me. And I looked over my left shoulder. And then there was Jesus. <laughs> and there was the donor. How do I know it was a donor? I just knew. It was like Jesus, like, here, here, he or she is. I don't, I can't remember. You know, the, the figures were like, even Jesus was kind of like, I couldn't see them fully. And I don't know why, for me, I don't know why that was. And, uh, but anyway, the Lord came up to me. And he put his hand on my left shoulder and he said, Mike, these are your new lungs. He goes, just receive them. And I said, yes, Lord. And at that moment, when I said, yes, Lord, I started floating back down to the OR table. And I, I just had the feeling that I had to agree with him. I had to agree to, that I would take this person's organ into my life, into my body. And, you know, as a transplant patient, that's so, you know, strange to even think about having somebody else's organ in your body. So God gave me the comfort to know that he knows about it. He knew about it before I even got the transplant done. He knew all things. And so I felt like I came back. Well, I came back. Let me tell you what happened. I came back into my body. And then I didn't remember anything after that, but I was in a coma for 10 days. So my wife was at home and she, uh, just, they discovered mold in the house. Well, that would, that would do me in as a transplant patient. So that she had to take care of all those, gut the bathroom and you know, do everything to get it ready for me. So during those, uh, first few days though, my wife was sitting and talking with her sister Kay, and she said, she just all of a sudden said, Kay, I, I don't know how do I know this. She says, but Mike's in heaven right now, thanking his donor. She goes, I don't even know how I know that. She goes, I just know it like I'm this, you know, something I just know deep inside. So her sister said, well, we'll see when he gets out of the coma. So what happened was, um, First of all, one of our friends, uh, Jonathan, called my wife um, during the transplant, and uh, or several days later, I can't remember the scenario, but anyway, he called and still told my wife, I was in my bedroom, and he lived like 45 minutes away from our house. He goes, I was in my bedroom. I got awoken up by an audible voice of God in my room. And the voice said, Mike is with me. He goes, I was so startled and I didn't want to call you because I didn't want to, you know, let you know that he's dead. <laughs> so he waited. So then <laughs> several days after that, he got an another awakening out of sleep. And the Lord said, he's back and he's with me. I mean, he's, he's back and uh, he was with me anyway. So. She tells my, he tells my wife this, well, I'm in a coma. So she's like, wow. And uh, kind of confirmed what she already knew. So then we have a friend who's a doubting Thomas. His name's Jeff. <laughs> so Jeff, here's Patty's story about me being in heaven, thanking my donor. And then he goes, listen, Mike 
when Mike comes out of the coma and he's in ICU and they take out the intubation tube out of his throat, I want to be there. So she said, okay, Jeff. So 10 days goes by. Um, they take the intubation tube, uh, the ventilator tube out of my throat. And Jeff comes in and then he says to my wife, Patty, he goes, don't say anything. I want to speak first. So, so he comes up to my bed <laughs> and literally the nurse had just taken the tube out of my throat. I mean, I was talking like three octaves lower because, you know, I hadn't, obviously I hadn't talked in over 10 days. I was in a coma. So Jeff goes, Mike, when you were out in the Netherlands, he goes, did you experience anything? And I mustered up strength enough to get my first words out of my mouth. And I said, yes, I went to heaven. I got to thank my donor. When I said that, my wife's eyes were like w just overwhelmed. She was like, she, she tells Jeff, I told you, I told you. He, he went to heaven and thanked his donor. And, and Jeff goes, you were right, Patty. And I was like, I'm like nodding my head. I'm like, yep, that's what happened. And, uh, you know, I just came back with, I, I feel like I came back with a message to tell people. You know, you hear about, you know, people saying, don't sweat the, sweat the small stuff. And that's kind of really what it came back with this message is even as Christians, you know, like, man, trust God. I mean, he's got everything orchestrated, everything in our life. He knows what's going to go uh, on in our life. He knows what's, you know, ahead of us. And he, he knows it. And he orchestrates angelic beings on our behalf to orchestrate things to happen the way it does. And so. You know, I just came back thinking, I, I don't, I guess I just don't worry about, like, I came down with COVID this past January. Now, listen, COVID would kill somebody like me that is immune suppressed, who, who had 55 surgery, right? But you know what? During that whole time, you know, I went and got a BAM infusion, the antibody infusion. But mainly, I, I stayed out of the hospital because I thought these guys would kill me if I go in. <laughs> so I got the infusion and went back to my bed. And I was in bed three weeks. But you know what? God's mercy, knowing I had that experience in heaven, I thought, this is nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he's, he's got this. I'm not going to die from this. I will not die from this. And God knows. And I believe he's, oh, yeah, this is what happened, by, by the way. Um, after my transplant and I got home, um, I'm laying in bed, recuperating after 64 stitches across my chest. And they break the uh, rib cage open and go in and get the lungs. So anyway, I was in my bedroom, and uh, you know my wife is at work, and I uh, just laying there trying to recuperate. And uh, all of a sudden, I open my eyes, and there's an angel standing in my room, tall as the ceiling to the floor. And just staring at me. <laughs> so I, I just said out loud, like, what is this, Lord? And the Lord said, they're just watching you. They're just, they're, they keep watching you. They haven't left you since heaven. <laughs> so I thought, that is amazing. I mean, that is amazing that, you know, we, we read about these stories in the Bible. And, and even like, uh, you know, just angels appearing to Joseph in a dream, right? Or, or, or other circumstances. And we just think, well, that's a nice story or that, that happened then, but will it happen now? Yeah, it will. And God continues to do things like that. And if we just need to believe that he is uh, much bigger than our problems, much bigger than what we go through. And, uh, you know, that's, it's just been an incredible journey. Um, and just like, just telling my story to you guys, I mean, like, I didn't really go out and tell my story. I mean, like, just, I'm not that type of person where, you know, I want everyone to, uh, look to me, you know, I just, I want them to see, to see the Lord in my life. So, but one day the Lord said, you need to start sharing your heaven testimony. And I said, okay, Lord. So like, I've been sharing it like with nurses because I go every a month to the hospital to do blood work and things. And I've been sharing it with, I don't know, people on the street, you know, like, I don't know, it's kind of weird, but 
you know, I just start sharing and people just break down and weep. And I had this one lady, I was in a store or something. No, I was in a hotel uh, when my sister-in-law uh, was uh, in the hospital and we were visiting her. And I was at the hotel and the lady said, I see you have a service dog with you. I said, yeah, I had a double lung transplant, but I died and went to heaven. And she goes, tell me more. So I did. And she just starts weeping. And she goes, you know what? I was really struggling with heaven. Is it real? Is God real? And she goes, man, you just, you coming to, to see me today at the front desk here and tell me that story. I, I, I have, I have so peace now. It's, it's not going to bother me anymore. And I think, you know, that that's, we overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the lamb. And I just believe that's what I've been doing is, is just sharing the testimony. Every one of us has a story. And of course, people with NDEs, yeah, we do have a story and it might seem strange to people and, and almost unbelievable that these things happen. But you know what? Uh, I'm still engaged in heaven. I mean, every time I tell a story, I, it's almost like I relive it. And I have the same feelings as when I was in heaven. And, uh, it, and I don't know. It just it's, shows what an awesome God that, they're, that he allows these things to happen to us to assure us, assure everybody that there's there's a place called heaven and uh they, he he wants you to go there and i tell people you know like i was kind of i brought up in a religious household so um so we kind of knew uh, all the stories of jesus we uh i was raised catholic so i knew all about jesus in my head but he hadn't reached my heart and so when i was a young man i think i was like 19 i can say that cuz i'm old now <laughs> but when I was a young man, I, I just simply said, God, if you're real, you know, you know, show me who you are. And then believe me, he he did. I asked him to come to my heart, change my life, do whatever you need to do. And man, I was I was totally radically changed from the person I used to be. And uh, it was all his doing. And, you know, and he showed himself faithful throughout all these years. He knew down the road that I was going to have uh, trouble with my lungs and that I was going to have a, a terminal illness. He knew, uh, he knew that already. And he kind of went before me and lined things up. So. Well, a, a couple of comments I'll throw out. So uh, in terms of all the people that we've interviewed so far, um, Mike is our, our second closest to his near death experience. We had a, another gal who was about a year out from her near death or afterlife experience. So Mike, you're about two and a half years out. So it's, it's interesting to me to be able to talk to somebody who is uh, not as far removed um, from their experiences. Um, also, uh, in terms of kind of that spirit to spirit communication, we pretty much get that from every single person we've talked to where uh, there was almost like a knowing or a, just you, know, you you didn't have to talk. You could just understand and, and, and converse. And it was just just kind of how it was. Um, what I'm curious to hear about. So. Uh, you going into this experience, you were uh, a charismatic, a charismatic Anglican priest. That's that's a bunch of words to fit in together. But so okay. you, you you were a pastor. You come from a, a Christian background uh, before having your near death experience, and that hasn't been everybody's uh, circumstance heading into their experience. But back uh, on your, I guess now on this other side of the journey, how has how has your um, time with the Lord? spiritual walk devotional like how has that shifted what's different for you because like many of the people we've talked to they always kind of and you, you've kind of alluded to this a little bit ago talked about how they always kind of have a foot in heaven like there's still there's there's yeah. that deep constant connection to what they experience on the other side so for you just how does your your daily walk with the lord look different uh on this part of your journey i've never asked anybody that before so i'm kind of curious well you know i was dubbed the hippie priest because you know I wore the robes and the clerical collar, but yeah, I danced a lot and raised my hands a lot. <laughs> so, you know, I was a, probably a nominally in the in church, but I, I also was an assembly of God pastor before I became a priest. So that kind of blew people's mind anyway. So, uh, so anyway, uh, what happened was I retired from the ministry when I got deathly ill, when I couldn't stand in the pulpit any longer. So, uh, which it was kind of a heartache for me because we had a great little, uh, church and, uh, 
you know, we just love ministering. And, you know, we did missionary work. We did a lot of things like that. But after my heavenly experience, things like really changed where I thought I was going to go back into ministry or do something after, um, after my transplant, but God had other plans. And so we always have to go with the plans that God lays out. And so, um, so things were so different. Like I would be in groups of people that I would never normally in, hang out with. <laughs> okay. So, and I go, God, wow. You know, like you're putting me in situations where like, I would choose to be in these situations only because, you know, it's uncomfortable or it's like, I don't know. And like, what do I do? But uh, it's so funny because he just, he just like, I don't know. I just had this chill attitude after being in heaven. And and it's just like, everything's okay. I don't have to be super spiritual or super religious. And it's just almost like that was lifted off of me where not that I was, but you know, Gotta admit, sometimes Christians can be a little uh, judgmental or a little uh, I don't know, religious and I don't care what church you go to, but you can fall into that trap. So anyway, uh I just find myself just being me and letting the Lord work through me through um, through my experience. And so I don't know, it was such a blessing in a way that I died because it's opened doors for me to share my story in, in different avenues and to, um, to let people know, you know, uh, it's okay. You know, like it's okay that you're suffering. It's okay that, you know, it's not okay, but it's okay that you could talk about it, you know? And, and normally, you know, we, we want to always have the answers, even as Christians, we want to have the answers and this is what the scriptures say. And, and, you know, this is how it should be. And, and I, I've learned more since my heavenly experience to listen seriously just listen to people let them talk let them share their story and their experiences of life and so now i think my ministry has switched to just i don't know to just be there you know i i heard this quote from some this week uh to be a witness is really to be with someone a witness, you know, like be there, be present in people's lives. And, and, you know, I think when we have these kind of experiences uh, and the experience, I don't want to say this to be proud or boastful, but I feel like I've been touched by heaven and that's an awesome responsibility. And I feel like I want to, I don't know how to explain this. I just want to give that to people. I want to give what I've been given from heaven to other people. Uh, and I really just feel that like when my sister-in-law was uh, dying in the hospital, you know, I, you know, part of me was like, come on, you're going to be healed. And, and then another part of me was like, you know what? God's got her in the palm of his hands. And so I was just present there with her. And, you know, you know, and I think that is important to be with people, weep with those who weep right? Rejoice when they're rejoicing. And, and just to be a, a real heaven ambassador to people, you know, to be there and to, uh, you know, when I came to know the Lord myself, um, a lot of it happened in my bedroom. <laughs> you know, like I, I went to churches and yeah, I went to the altar and I did some things, but most of my encounters with God happened in a personal way, walking in the woods <laughs> or, you know, just, uh, I don't know. I can't explain it. So that when I went to heaven, I came back and I thought, you know what? I think I made things too hard. You know, I, I, I think God's got it. I don't need to help him as much as I thought he needed to help him, <laughs> you know? And I think he's always reaching out to man. He's always reaching to, uh, to show his love, his mercy. And, uh, and I just believe that. And I'm just a vessel. I just, now I just, you know, say, God, what do you want me to do? You want me to be a motivational speaker? What do you, what do you want me to do? So, so that's what I, you know, I'm just, just listening to him every day and doing what I can. And, and then doors open for me that like, I think really, like I had Mike Huckabee call me and say, Hey, uh, I'm making you a Huck's hero. 
can you come down to Nashville and be on my TV show? I'm like, sure. And like, and then my story, uh, I had a documentary uh, from a news uh, station here in Louisville. They followed me around for a year. And here's the funny thing. Okay, it went, my story wins an Emmy Award. The funny thing about that was I was an actor in New York in musical theater. And so I gave that up when I was 19 to be in the ministry. And like 30, 35 years later, I'm walking the red carpet with this newscaster and he hands me the Emmy Award and he said, this is yours. And I'm like, you know, I, I tease. I said, it took dying to get noticed around here. But, uh, but seriously, I looked up to heaven. And I said, God, you have a sense of humor. He always turns things for our good. It may take a little longer than we expected, but he always does. So when I go in my living room, I look at this Emmy Award, I just chuckle because I think, because it's engraved, uh, I'm dying, will you help, which is my story. And I just laugh because I'm like, I'm just like a little podunk pastor in Kentucky with an Emmy Award. You know, like, who does that? God does that. (laughs) So... Mike, you're you're a walking miracle. And, you know, one of the things we talked about prior to the show was just how you've been able to minister to others. And what I find so fascinating about your story, and I've followed you now, uh, as you know, we've exchanged on Facebook. You recently had uh, some challenges with pneumonia. You mentioned COVID, actually, that you contracted, which for somebody who has what an immunodepressancy, a depressants, uh, as you have with your medication, uh, that uh, typically doesn't end well. Um, and, no. You know, and so, what I find intriguing about your story and encounter in heaven is that you wanted to meet your donor. Yeah. Uh, and I've learned in just kind of the brief interactions on social media and the like that you have a a tender heart toward other people. Yeah. And I've heard this from other um, donor recipients that they're very thankful for the donor, but the Lord gave you this, this sight of your donor in, in heaven. Have you followed up at all uh, since that time and, and trying to uh, express that gratitude? Yes. Uh, You know, as transplant uh, patients were encouraged to write the donor families and I have, twice but sometimes the pain is so unbearable that it takes a while for them to write back and so they have received my letters they know that i'm interested in meeting them and i can't wait to meet them because i want to share with them that your loved one was in heaven i think that would mean a, a lot to them and so i'm waiting for that day and praying that that would happen and um so you know i did reach out to them so uh, hoping for that day to come well, and Randy, that was a short answer. So if you got another question to throw in there, I'll, I'll let you get a second one in if you'd like, Sarah. I've got more, but I, I don't want you to miss out. You know, there is a uh, kindred feeling that I have uh, since we've done this series, uh, Mike and Sean and our audience, uh, with others who have had encounters of different different uh, experiences, but much th- different, but the same. Um, yep. and Mike, you and I had met the Lord as believers. Yeah. But one of the things that I discovered was that my faith, that is, was prior to this, was one um, I, I realized for me personally was more of a hope rather than a conviction. Yeah. And that conviction that comes through the experience is, is obvious in that you have an encounter like this how can you not believe it is? Yeah. I, you know, I feel like we're the doubting, I was the doubting Thomas at least, you know, and Jesus held out his hand and said, go ahead and, and touch um, my hand, the, the, where the crucifixion had occurred. So you came back having been a pastor and having ministered to others. I'm curious as to how your ministry to others is from a pastor who preaches the word of God to now a pastor who has met the word of God. 
How does that, how did that translate for you in your own pastorship and ministering to others? Well, you know, we, as a pastor, I, I preach things from the pulpit, preach from the word of God and believed in what I experienced, but it's a whole nother ball game when, when you actually, you know, are in the presence of Jesus and in heaven and came back going, it was like, I don't know, you know, the scriptures where it says, uh, our, didn't our hearts burn within us as we were in his presence? And, you know, that's kind of like it is for me now is that I, I just want everyone to know how much God loves them deeply. And that's what I try to convey. Maybe I'm not in the pulpit now, but I, I have a, other avenues that I'm using to to convey that message is that, you know, we are so tunnel visioned. Uh, even as human beings about our life experiences and, and what all that, how all that affects us. But, you know, my, I guess my focus now is to let people know God loves you deeply. God understands even your shortcomings, even your failures. You know, a lot of people just give up because they thought I'm never going to be good enough or I'm never going to overcome the situation or, or forgive people. You know, and uh, I just don't, I don't know, I just don't think they understand the grace and the mercy that God affords us if we just let him work in our everyday lives, in our everyday circumstances, and just to, you know, I don't know, just see him high and lifted up, you know, he, who he is, the high king of heaven, and uh, just to see Maybe we have misconceptions about who God is. Maybe we, we we just, you know, have seen him as that authoritative figure with a with a bat in his hand ready to bop us one because we've messed up. Or I don't know. People just have a lot of weird ideas about God. But I just feel like after my experience, I have a lot more compassion, to tell you the truth. And I'll tell you this one story, and, and it's happened to me often since I've been to heaven is I'll see someone on the street and my attitude, my like beggars, you know, on the side of the highway. And my attitude used to be like, come on, dude, you got brand new sneakers on and a brand new backpack. You're not fooling me. You want this money for drugs. You want this money for whatever. You know, I was just, you know, a little judgmental and a little sarcastic, you know, and after I came back, I started looking at the people maybe as God would see them. Even if they're shysters, why are they there? Why are they doing that? What brought them to that place? And, 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 you know, if we would only see people through God's eyes and to say, yeah, there could be people that are annoying you today. People who, you know, are just, you know, making your skin crawl or, or maybe certain people that, you know, you, you see in the news that really, you know, like, oh man, God, can you not take care of this situation? You know? We need to see things through God's perspective, and we need to see things in the light of eternity. What's really taking place here with my neighbor? What's really taking place, you know, with the cashier at the store? And if we could just be sensitive, you know, I try to smile a lot. I mean, that's my MO. I smile, I engage, even if just for a moment with a cashier at the supermarket, you know, like. I'm given a moment in time with a person and I want to make sure in that moment of time that they feel validated, they feel loved and that they, you know, they know, because I always talk, share something about my life, something about heaven, something about the father heart of God. So they, they can think about their own life. And, and normally I think when I share what I've been through, which I'm finding myself sharing it a lot. And, and it, I think it brings hope. And what thing, one thing we need in this world right now is, is hope. So. Yeah, I'll give that an amen. We definitely need uh, a lot of hope in this season, but as the world uh, grows continually darker, I, I feel like 
that that want that need of hope only exposes how much more we need Jesus in our lives and so that while it's it's dark it's challenging i feel like that's also a hopeful aspect of the season that we're walking through uh, and and mike we've had other guests talk about how you know being in heaven they're in an environment that's just saturated in love and that they're immersed in love and they come back shifted and changed and clearly that's shifted uh your perspective with how you see pe- see people almost sounds like you're able to see people with the eyes of Jesus. You're able to view people kind of through that lens of love that Jesus has for us. And uh, I I just really appreciate you sharing that. Um, Almost time for us to wrap up. Uh, You know, with these sorts of interviews, uh, you know, when we start talking about near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, all the different things, it attracts a wide range of viewers and listeners, uh, some who grew up in church, some who came to faith later in life, but others who they're just interested in the paranormal or supernatural. Maybe they've never darkened the door of a church. And for the right. the person who's taken the time to listen to this conversation or watch it, um, they don't really they're they're far away from Jesus. They maybe don't have any idea who he is. As they process what they've heard, as you've shared your story, what would be your invitation to them uh, that Jesus wants to meet them and Jesus wants to impact their life just as much as he's impacted the lives of all three of us who are on this broadcast today? Sure. You know, like I, I've done some interviews where, you know, I looked at the comments afterwards and some people were like, didn't like the Christian aspect of my journey. And I, I, I would just tell them or anybody, you know, like God is love in him is the fullness of love. And so if you're searching, ask him. Ask him. I mean, he wants us to ask questions. He just wants to say, you know, who are you? You Who is this Jesus that Mike's talking about? Who who is this? I don't want another religion. And I I always tell people, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. That's the best thing is is not to minimize God on my level, but he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You know, I talk to God. Of course, every day. And and just I talk to him um and just even in all my struggles in, in every every situation uh that I go through, I just talk to him like a friend, like God, I'm I'm struggling here. I'm not perfect, my halo isn't above my head, you know. I'm just <laughs> uh, you know, I'm still a work in progress. So I just, you know, try to tell people, even if they're not believers, you know, like listen. Do you ever consider that maybe God has a plan in everything that you're going through and, and try to kind of point them heavenward that God, God can work through, you know, God can work. I, I believe God works through every religion, every, every person, and he's always reaching out. He's a God that's always forward thinking, always looking toward us and wanting the best for us. And so when I have people that maybe don't believe in Jesus, I say, you know what, you know, uh, I I know you're struggling with that thought, but you know what? God loves you. Start with that. God loves you. And, you know, uh, consider that Jesus was more than a prophet, you know, more than a, a, you know, what we view and what Christianity has, you know, put out there, consider who he really was and and look at his teachings and look at his life, you know? And and so I try to direct him in that way. And you know what? The bottom line is we're living examples. We should be living examples every day on who, who, you know, I've heard this time, time again, you kind of start acting like who you hang around with. <laughs> and, you know, I hang around with Jesus. So hopefully, you know, I'm, he's rubbing off on me and I'm rubbing off on others, you know, and there's, uh, you know, that, that's what I hope, you know, I, I, I can only hope that my life made a difference here on the earth that I could, that I made an influence for the kingdom of God and that people see the joy of the kingdom. And that's one thing that it's undeniable that there's joy in the kingdom of God and there's peace and, and man, if anything, that experience in heaven showed me 
wow, what? I mean, I want everyone to experience that. I, that's why I share the story. You, you just got to go there. I don't want you to die to go there, but I'm just saying, you got to be in the presence of Jesus. When I was there, he filled all in all. And you know what? He could do that for you right here on earth. You know, it's his prayer way. You know, and I, I did. I just said, God, if you're real, Jesus, if you're real, make yourself known to me. And that's what I tell people. Try him out. You'll never regret it. <laughs> you know, Mike, the, uh, and then we're, uh, we're closing here. And uh, you have spoken to so many hearts, uh, uh, people who just are struggling today. This seems to be uh, kind of an era, a time when many people are going through pain, suffering, and doubt. And so you're assuaging many of those with just the genuineness of, of who Christ is. And I know that we pay tribute to God as God of love. But you're uh, expressing that in a way that is sincere because you've had that encounter with love himself. And so we so much appreciate you being on the show. I've wanted you uh, for a long time to uh, be a part of this program. And I know that our listeners and viewers have been greatly blessed. And we thank you immensely for being with well, us. I really appreciate you having me. You know, uh, I, I really I haven't really told my personal testimony, but I came from a, a very abusive background and uh, a lot of uh, sexual abuse and when I was younger. And you know what? When I met Jesus, he set me free from all the wounding. And, you know, and so when I went to heaven, to, to just feel that that slate was washed clean. And uh, I knew that here on the earth. I knew that through scripture. But when I got to heaven and, and, and that feeling of being bathed in his light, you know, that's what I want to tell people. You might have been through horrendous things in your life. You you might have been, you know, through things that are unspeakable. But you know what? God was there with you. No, he didn't like what you went through. But he was there. He's And he's guiding you out into the light. Amen. Amen. And And, and Mike, thank you so much for sharing your amazing journey, your powerful story. I know for some of our listeners and viewers, maybe this conversation challenged you. For some others, I know it encouraged you. Either way, if it provoked you, uh, we'd like you to leave a comment. If you have a question, um, leave a question wherever you listen to or, or, or watch this video, because uh, Randy and I will do a follow-up session where he and I will kind of process Mike's story. You know, where do we see this in scripture? How does this compare to other, convers that, um, other conversations that we've had? Uh, throughout the season. So if you have something you want to contribute to that conversation, uh, we'd welcome those questions so Randy and I can respond to those personally. And, you know, for those of you who, who have been on the journey with us, we just appreciate you being a part of each and every one of these two Christian Dudes podcasts. One way you can help us get the word out is to follow, like, share, all the things you can do to help get the word out about a podcast. Uh, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, give us a five-star review and leave a review. That helps other people uh, to find it more. And so again, thanks for being a part of this conversation. We look forward to seeing you again soon on another episode of the two Christian dudes podcast. Goodbye. Thank you.